Jean Michael Freit has expertise in the development of passive wireless acoustic transducers acting as sensors with the Sensor Company and the Time and Frequency Department of the Femto ST Institute in France. He's focused on bulk and surface acoustic transducers and the associated radar like electronic systems for the development of passive sensors interrogated through wireless radio frequency links. He's currently an associate professor employed by the Université de France in Besnon, France, located at the Time and Frequency Department of Femto ST for his research activities. Following the three month visit to PRM Sato's laboratory in CNEAS in Sendai, Japan, at the end of 2017, his activities have shifted toward passive radar and phased antenna array processing, still applied to passive acoustic sensor cooperative targets. Please welcome Jean Michael Fried. The presentation we're about to uh, stream here is uh, about software defined radio based synthetic aperture radar, noise, and uh, OFDM, basically Wi Fi emitter radar mapping. Uh, this is a work that we perform with my colleague Wei Feng. Uh, and uh, it uh, aims at uh, completing the presentation we make at the Software Defined Radio Academy uh, uh, last summer. Uh, and uh, one of the focus is how to uh, best use the various frameworks we have access to. So basically, the radio, of course, for radio frequency sync processing, Python, which is the underlying language of new radio, and Octave, the uh, free open source implementation of MATLAB for uh, signal processing. So what was the outline of the talk? Uh, during lockdown, we were uh, stuck at home and wondering how far this house opposite of our balcony was. And we wanted to make a, a radar system to measure this, this range. So uh, the French Geographic Institute uh, aerial map says that it's about 50 meters. So basically, we would like to use readily uh, available hardware for fabricating a short range radar system able to map the distance to the house uh, about 15 years away. So basically what do we have? We have uh, DVB-T uh, antennas or Wi-Fi antennas. We have Pluto SDR and its research B210 and various passive radio frequency uh, components, Peter attenuators. So what we would like to try is to assemble a radar system for mapping various targets, and at the end of the talk, we'll show how to make interferometric synthetic aperture radar, so uh, sub-wavelength uh, range measurement. What is the basics of radar systems? Bay radar systems uh, are based on, on, a, on a fundamental physical property, which is the range resolution is the velocity of light divided by twice uh, the bandwidth of a signal. You see here that the uh, uh, carrier frequency uh, doesn't appear, only the bandwidth, and the twice here is the two-way trip uh, from the emitter to the receiver. So the objective of a, of a range uh, resolved uh, radar system is to increase as much as possible B to have as high as possible a range resolution. So increasing B could be a frequency swept radar, which is the classical approach of, of, a, of a chirp. Uh, it could be uh, OFDM, uh, Orthogonal frequency or multiplexing as used in, in Wi-Fi. Uh, this is the approach that was uh, discussed in, in uh, Martin Brown's uh, PhD. Or what I like is noise radar, where you uh, modulate uh, the carrier with a pseudo random sequence, and by doing this, you spread the spectrum uh, over the whole bandwidth of the uh, rate at which the, the property, either amplitude or phase, in our case, will be will be varying. This is the approach that's used in the in the CDMA modulation of, of GPS, and actually it's been known for a very long time. If you look at some of the oldest literature on noise radar, 1957. Uh, it was already well known that you could spread the spectrum using uh, a white noise. Uh, uh. And, and why does uh, spread the spectrum allow for range resolution? Because the correlation between a reference signal and a surveillance signal will show a, a peak uh, at the various delays introduced by, by the uh, uh, targets. Now, correlations uh, by using the convolution theorem uh, are best computed using Fourier transform because the Fourier transform of a cross correlation is the Fourier transform of a reference signal times the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform of the surveillance signal complex conjugate because you have to flip time with respect to the convolution. 
And another way of doing this is uh, using the Fourier transform of reference, but instead of flipping time by using the complex conjugate, you can take the division. This will allow for uh, removing the amplitude variation uh, within the spectrum, and yet the, the phase uh, will be inverted by using the, ratio, the, the, the inverse of, of, of a complex quantity. Now, there's a challenge here in uh, GNU radio uh, being uh, uh, synchronizing the emitter and the receiver is a, is a challenging task in GNU radio. So uh, what we're doing here is instead of trying to synchronize emitter and receiver, we have one emitter, in our case, a Pluto SDR, and this local oscillator will modulate, uh, will generate a, a transmitted signal, which is modulated. And what we're going to do with a B210 dual channel receiver is we're going to record on the one hand what is transmitted uh, through attenuators to protect the input here and use the received signal. And by having these two information, which are both clocked on the same local oscillator, so we have two IQ streams which are coherent, then we can uh, use new radio to cross-correlate the stream. And because these two data sets have been collected simultaneously, we know that they are synchronous. So we don't have the issue of synchronizing emitter and receiver. Uh, how do you actually implement this? Well, let's first try to see how we can uh, spread the spectrum. And for spectrum spreading, what we're doing here is we're using a random source. And this random source, uh, which is DC block, just to remove uh, the DC offset from the random source, uh, modulates the phase so that we have a constant amplitude signal. And by modulating the phase, we spread the spectrum. As you can see here, this is the, the Pluto SDR uh, output, uh, which has been spread. And we measure using the B210 inputs on, on the Qt graphical user interface, uh, frequency spectrum display. And what you see here is the, the background noise. And when you modulate uh, your, your output here at 2.7 megasample per second, which is limited by the communication bandwidth with the Pluto SDR, you see here that you have this nicely uh, flat spectrum over the whole bandwidth. So uh, this demonstrates that we can have uh, the, the, the spectrum spreading property using a pseudo-random sequence on, on, on modulating the phase of, of the output signal. Now, the, the challenge here is to uh, collect the two signals and, and stream them uh, to, the, to the processing circuit. And uh, doing this while sweeping the local oscillator. Why do we need to sweep the local oscillator? Because, as mentioned, the, the communication bandwidth with the Pluto SDR is limited to about 2 uh, megahertz. And 2.7 megahertz, if you take C over 2B, is 56, 56 meter range resolution. And if you want to map a house which is located 50 meters away, that's not enough. So what you will do is to step the local oscillators over the frequency range and accumulate uh, the various spectra at uh, varying local oscillator frequencies with a constant B, the bandwidth. And the sequential sweep will allow you to stack uh, frequencies. I, I learned recently that this is called frequency stacking. And so uh, what we do here is collect time series, uh, switch the local oscillator of the emitter and the receiver, and repeat this over the full accumulated bandwidth. Now, GNU Radio does not know how to change the local oscillator from the uh, GNU Radio companion uh, flowchart. So what we're going to do here is we're going to program the local oscillator of transmitter and receiver using an external software, in my case, GNU Octave, because it's the software I knew best. You can also do this in Python. And what we're going to do is stream the data continuously using a, a UDP-like uh, zero MQ publish uh, sync. And these data will be collected by Octave whenever they, they're ready. So what we have here is a constant stream as, as new radio uh, wants us to do. And what we're going to do is only collect the data when the local oscillators have stabilized. So how do you actually implement this? This is the kind of Python code that was generated by GNU Radio. So you see here that you've got all your parameters. So for example, set the frequency, your local oscillator frequency for the Pluto SDR and for the uh, USRP for the B210. And if we call this set F with a new parameter F here, then we can uh, sweep the local oscillators. On the uh, Octave side, we have a connection to the 0MQ socket, which is streaming the data from GNU Radio to, to Octave. And uh, we have a, 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 TC, a TCP IP socket where we can send uh, information to the uh, uh, server here in order to change uh, the, 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 the frequency. Uh, the, the socket is over here. So for example, we send a plus symbol to tell uh, uh, the Python server to uh, sweep a local oscillator. And at the end, we quit uh, the, uh, the local oscillator. So this is what we described in, in SDRA. 
And since then, we've been told that uh, rather than changing the Python code, which means that you have uh, no longer the ability to come back to, to New Radio Companion to graphically change your flowchart, we've been informed on, on the New Radio uh, mailing list, discussion mailing list, that actually can use a Python snippet to uh, launch your server and you can include the server as a Python module. So here in this example, we create our server uh, as, as, as a Python module. And this Python module is called from the Python snippet here, where we start a, a separate thread. And this separate thread uh, uh, is given as an argument self, which means that we're sending as an argument to the server all the structures that were created in this flowchart. And for example, here you can call this set f, uh, so set uh, local frequency or set f a prior frequency. And this allows you to change the properties of uh, the, 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 the variables in this flowchart. So in this example, you see, for example, that I change the local oscillator of, of my signal source. And indeed, uh, you see on, on the graphical uh, frequency sync that the uh, frequency, local frequency has risen four times. So indeed, it's working. And in the, in the X term where uh, we launch a new radio companion, we indeed see the information that the local oscillator was changed whenever we, we sent a command. So this is how we were going to work. We have a, 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 TCP, IP, a, a TCP IP server running as, as, as a Python module inside the flowchart, and, and uh, Octave will send uh, information. In this case, it was a, a, a telnet, but uh, we're going to run the socket from Octave. And Octave will, on the one hand, uh, tell the local oscillator to sweep, and on the other hand, will fetch the, the, the zero MQ stream to, um, to display uh, the cross correlation. So, that's the resulting setup of the B210 with its reference channel through two attenuators to protect uh, the input. Uh, the coupler, 10 dB coupler here, so that the output of the P2SDR is on the one hand sent to the transmitter antenna and the receiver antenna goes to the second uh, uh, input of the B210. All the data are streamed through USB3. And when we try to work with this setup where so the, the local oscillator here offset with a, a B210 local oscillator will be uh, cancelled because these two uh, channels are uh, referenced to the same local oscillator. As we were collecting this data, we noticed that we had a uh, loss of coherence when we were uh, changing the local oscillator. And that was tracked back to the fact that the Pluto SDR requires with the default uh, GRIIO library about one second to settle because all parameters of the AD9363 here are changed whenever we change the, the local oscillator properties. Uh, we'll come to this later by updating the, the GRIO uh, to only change the local oscillator and this one second settling time will be uh, removed. Um, so you run this, so you sweep your frequency and here is a noise radar centered on 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, we'll skip uh, the, the VHF uh, DVB-T experiment and uh, immediately go to the uh, Wi-Fi band, the ISM band around 2.4 gigahertz uh, because that's what we're going to use later with Wi-Fi. And uh, here what you see is if you correlate the reference signal with the measurement signal uh, when sweeping this whole frequency band uh, on the noise radar, so that's about uh, 100 sweep um, plus or minus 50 megahertz each collected with uh, one megahertz bandwidth, uh, you see that we have multiple echoes. Of course, you've got the direct uh, cross talk between emitter and receiver at zero delay. But then we have a few echoes, uh, which is already C over uh, 2B. So uh, this is already uh, the velocity of light divided by twice the delay. So it's already a range. And uh, we have echoes around 20, uh, 28, 46, 49, 54 meters. So this makes sense because uh, the house is claimed to be around 50 meters away. And if you draw these echoes uh, as circles centered on the emitter, this is my balcony here, you see here this is the 29 meters, the four, um, that's 46, 49, 54 meters. So these are the various uh, ranges. And you see indeed that there are some structure that might match, obviously, all these guys here around the house that we want to map. Um, but there is no certainty uh, whether this echo here is the chimney or if it's a house, or if it's one of these uh, corners over here. So we do not have any azimuth resolution, we only have range resolution during this. Um, so now we uh, would like uh, to hide our emission uh, in the uh, surrounding noise, in the electromagnetic smog that we have around us. So instead of doing noise radar, you might also consider 
uh, Wi-Fi, so OFDM, uh, orthogonal uh, frequency division multiple uh, subcarrier access. And in the case of Wi-Fi, we have uh, in Western Europe, we have 11 channels, uh, each separated by 5 megahertz, so that's a bit less bandwidth, 55 megahertz, but we can do exactly the same. We can sweep the various carriers by emitting, uh, by streaming information uh, from this time the Wi-Fi dongle instead of the Pluto HDR. And again, you have the same story by cross-correlating the transmitted signal with the received signal. We have the zero delay echo, and we've got all these echoes here between uh, 30 and, and 50 meters, so that, that consistent with the noise radar measurement. The only trick here is that if you look at the spectrum, the OFDM spectrum of uh, a Wi-Fi signal, then you've got all these sub-carriers, uh, and because you've got this uh, structure on the spectrum, you cannot use the, the measure the, the, the complex conjugate multiplication for calculating correlation, because doing this will introduce a lot of uh, side loads due to these artifacts, and by taking the ratio of the measurement to the reference channel, you can cancel these magnitude uh, fluctuations, and furthermore, because the uh, zero channel is not used it's wise to offset the receiver local oscillator with respect to the uh, transmitter local oscillator so that the center frequency is on one of these uh, half spectrum. So in our case, we're sampling 6 megahertz and we switch by 3 megahertz uh, the local oscillator so that we can only collect the data away from this uh, unused channel and avoid this hole in the spectrum. So this is all very nice, we have range resolution, but now we would like to have azimuth resolution to make sure that we know what is the target. So how do you add azimuth resolution? We see, this is where the carrier frequency comes in play, not only the bandwidth. Now what we know is that uh, uh, the, 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 the beam width of an antenna is given by the wavelength divided by the antenna diameter. So how do you make a directional beam? Well, you need a, a, a large antenna. So for example, on this uh, airport radar, you see that you have a wide parabola, which makes a narrow beam and allows you to know where the plane uh, reflecting the, 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 the echo are located in azimuth. Now, uh, this is one way of doing it. Of course, I cannot put such a wide uh, antenna on my balcony. So another way of doing this is to say we synthesize this antenna by moving the unique antenna, so the small antenna, broadband antenna here, over a, a, rail, a range of diameter D. And this will allow us to synthesize such a, a broad antenna. So that's the basics of synthetic aperture radar, where you simulate uh, an antenna with, uh, with D by moving the, uh, the unique antenna uh, with small steps. Here, the graduation are every uh, quarter wavelength. And so you end up with a 3 dB beam width which is given by uh, 0.89, the wavelength, divided by n times the number of steps times the distance between steps. And for example, in our case, if we make something like 1.4 meter long uh, uh, motion of, of this uh, uh, antenna, uh, then we have about 4.5 degree uh, beam width, which uh, at 100 meter gives us an azimuth resolution of 8 meters. So this will clearly allow us to identify whether the reflector is from the house or, or any other uh, target. So uh, by doing this, what you end up is uh, uh, having a, an antenna with a uniform uh, spacing between antennas, and uh, this will act as a, a uniform linear array where your plane wave is reaching your antenna with uh, a wave vector k here, which is projected on this baseline. Uh, and this uh, introduces a phase, which is uh, uh, 2 pi uh, over lambda times the distance sine of the angle. So what you can see here is actually that uh, your signal that you received at the uh, uh, ND's uh, antenna is actually phase shifted by this, this phase that is introduced. And this is a, a, a linearly uh, varying phase because here you have this N index. So in other words, this is a unique signal that is phase shifted uniformly along the uh, antenna array. And this, in other words, is a fully transformed uh, because this is a, a uniform uh, uh, frequency step. Uh, phase step. So now what we end up having is a matrix where we have this time domain information which will give us the range compression and in this direction here we have the antenna position. So this is your space-time uh, matrix and what you see now is that it would be natural 
to try to recover the azimuth information through the Fourier transform because of this property, because along this axis here we have a uniform phase variation. And as we've seen earlier, range compression is a correlation, and correlation is the inverse Fourier transform of the dot product of two Fourier uh, multiplications. So uh, it's natural to consider that uh, range azimuth compression is a 2D Fourier transform, uh, where range resolution is only given by the signal bandwidth, while azimuth resolution is given by the displacement range and the wavelength. Uh, and another way of seeing this, and it's a very nice demonstration from this website here, which tells us that the 2D Fourier transform of this quantity here of two uh, sine wave is a Dirac function. So if at the end we would like to have a single target at x0, y0, then we must try to find an expression where we separate uh, the x and y quantities. Now, if we go from the signal that we receive uh, at time uh, p and, and, and q position, uh, you see here that uh, with respect to the radar cross-section data, we only have the phase information which is given by the q frequency and the p position of, of uh, the range to the target. And this quantity here mixes the range and the azimuth. So what we need is to separate these two variables. And, and what you do here to, re to separate these two variables is you take the Taylor expansion by assuming that uh, the, the, the range variation is much bigger, the range to the target is much bigger than the, than the displacement of the antenna. And under this assumption, you can separate the range and the azimuth. And thanks to the separation of the two variables, you end up having these two quantities that are separate. Now we have a range quantity, we have an azimuth quantity. And so what you end up is having a 2D Fourier transform. Uh, I'll, I'll let you go through the detail of this demonstration, but that, that's the basics of, of why you can do a 2D Fourier transform to recover azimuth. So um, once you've uh, addressed this, uh, this mathematical analysis, you can take your uh, pattern where you have antenna position and range. And if you take uh, a fully transform along this direction, you see here azimuth compression, where you've got the sign of the uh, azimuth over here, you've got the range over here, and you see the various targets that have been compressed along the azimuth. And if you transform the sign of the azimuth into an angular information using uh, this mapping here, you end up with having your various targets at the various azimuth and range, and that's your uh, range azimuth compression. You can do this a bit more fancy than the basic uh, uh, Fourier transform. You can make a full uh, back projection algorithm as, as uh, using the full uh, expression of the previous slide, and this is what you get. And if you filter properly your back projection, you get the various uh, targets in the azimuth and range uh, that gives you the spatial resolution that we're looking for. So if we do this, well, actually, the beauty of this calculation is that there is no degree of freedom because this range information is only given by the bandwidth of the signal and the azimuth is only given by the spacing between the steps. And so you have no degree of freedom when you map these uh, reflections over uh, uh, aerial photography. So we see here a few uh, echoes of our uh, noise radar. And if we zoom in, uh, we see now with a lower threshold that indeed the house is generating some echoes. We have a various few other echoes here, and these roofs of the box parking lots here are acting as corner reflectors. So here you have echoes, very strong echoes. So now this proves us that indeed the echo around uh, 48 meters was from the house, here is the tree, and here are the few corner reflectors uh, from the structure of, of the roof of these uh, box parking lots. And here are a few echoes from this, this building here. Um, we can do the same with the Wi-Fi. You see here some, uh, this is only a, a zero uh, milliwatt uh, output. Uh, I put a attenuator and using uh, Bastian Brussels packet spammer for continuously uh, streaming Wi-Fi uh, information over the full 55 megahertz bandwidth. We see here a few echoes, again, uh, the house, uh, the various roofs here and some echoes uh, a few uh, tens of meters away. So this is working very nicely. So this is the basics of uh, synthetic aperture radar. Now, can we go even beyond and use uh, interferometric synthetic aperture radar? Interferometric synthetic aperture radar is based on the idea that uh, your reflection so far, we've only used the magnitude of the reflection, but actually your quantity that we record is an IQ stream, which is a complex quantity. And each one of these targets will reflect an information 
whose phase is representative of a fine displacement uh, from one image to another. So if we look at this phase information here, we might be able to recover a fine uh, motion of a target. So of course the roof is not going to move, so what we need is to create a reflector whose uh, um, radar cross-section is about the same as, as the various targets, the cars here, uh, but which is much easier to move because we want to look at, at, at fine motion of the target. So this is a corner reflector, and uh, my colleague Philippe Abbe assembled this for me. So these are uh, three plates at 90 degrees, one from another. And we locate this corner reflector here and we try to analyze the phase of uh, uh, IQ coefficient uh, when this uh, reflector is, is sending the beam back to the, to the emitter. Now to do this, you need to have reproducible position of the antenna and this is achieved by uh, motorizing the displacement, so this is a bit more of a fancy setup. Uh, again, my, my colleague assembled this for me, where we move uh, the antenna with a rail along uh, known uh, positions every quarter wavelength. Uh, here, using the case my controller, it could be a Raspberry Pi uh, using uh, used for from moving the the, uh, the 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 antenna along the the rail. Uh, this is actually quite a slow setup here. Uh, in this experiment, it takes about an hour to make a full uh, 1.4 meter long sweep, but this is the result that is achieved. Here is uh, your house. Uh, this is uh, the two echoes that we saw earlier uh, on the roof. And this echo here, this guy, is a corner reflector. If you remove a corner reflector, you have a, a strong loss of reflection. This proves that this is the corner reflector position. And this is the phase when the corner reflector with reference to the reference image where the reflector was moved by zero centimeter at the end of the experiment, was moved by one centimeter, you see it over here, was moved by two centimeter, you see it over here. So you can recover from the phase of fine displacement. If you repeat this experiment many times, you can address how the corner reflector was moved uh, by steps of one centimeter. And by analyzing the phase here, you see that indeed uh, the phase is moving uh, over a full wavelength, a half wavelength actually because of a two-way trip. And on the other hand, the roof over the one-day measurement has not moved uh, by more than four millimeters. What is this four millimeter phase variation? Well, actually a tentative uh, error budget tells us that on the one hand, the local oscillator here is uh, shifting a little bit. And if you, I will not get into the details of the calculation, but if you look here, at uh, how the phase noise of the local oscillator, uh, because there is some delay between the transmitter and the received uh, signal due to the target distance, uh, uh, this accounts for about uh, a 0.1 millimeter variation. And the most uh, significant variation is, is weather condition. So the temperature has been shifting over the full day of the measurement. It's been raining a little bit. The moisture level has been changing. And if you account for the variation of the optical index, which is well documented in the literature, this is the pressure, this is the water partial pressure, this is the temperature. You have here the variation of the optical index. And that accounts for about 0.6 millimeters if your temperature is variating, uh, is varying by, by 10 degrees, uh, 10 Kelvin, which is about what we see here. And actually the strongest contribution is moisture and moisture will account for a couple of millimeter variations. So at the end, by adding these various weather condition and local oscillator variation, you end up with about uh, a couple millimeter uh, variation over a full day. So to conclude this presentation, we wanted to show how using software defined radio, you can uh, make a, a software uh, SDR based uh, a radar system using uh, various uh, sp uh, spectrum spraying techniques, whether noise radar or OFDM, by taking the best of each of these frameworks, new radio, Python, Octave. Uh, we've extended this analysis to synthetic aperture radar, and at the end, we went into interferometric displacement measurement, uh, showing that there is some uh, a variation of a range due to uh, local oscillator fluctuations and weather conditions. Uh, you can check the GitHub of this project to get the scripts uh, for processing and acquiring data and uh, further perspective are to apply this knowledge to uh, satellite uh, radar systems. Uh, Europe is, is uh, giving you uh, freely the Sentinel-1 data sets that you can download and display, and these are the raw IQ data that you can process using this kind of information. So have fun uh, processing this kind of, of data. And um, thank you for your attention.